best, the best it was all day right now. Last I get a ride up. I doggied over the inside. I was. Made it. It was so f deep up there. Sketchy. I spent nine hours in the water up until this point. So I went back to the Zodiac and I'm just like, I'm done. We were headed back. We we're gonna check Safi one last time before dark. Every one of us was like very, very fatigued and worn out. Most importantly, we we're just ear to ear smile. Like that was the best day of surfing of our lives. And we checked Safi and first thing off the back, we just seen this wave come in that was psycho. I think Luke's like, I'm gonna just go get a couple. He pals out. This is an opportunity of a lifetime to score these waves. Like we just have to milk it for everything it's worth. I look at Kyle and Kyle's like, yeah, I'm gonna go too. He takes his GoPro. I'm just like, oh, I guess I gotta go now. So we traded off on a couple, and I just remember being like, you guys, like, it's so good out here. The rotation kept spinning, and boom, I'm up to bat. And the set coming in, Jerome looked at me and he goes, this is the one. And got this chip shot, easy entry, pulled in like up top. And as I came out the bottom, I could just see the wave pulling so much water off the sand. So I shed all the speed. And as soon as I got in the barrel, I could tell like this was probably the thickest, craziest wave I'd gotten the whole trip. And like that, I felt it. I felt it happening and it caught my outside edge. And as I fell, I went up and over the falls, and as I went up and over, I hit. When I hit, I knocked out. Boom. Gone. And then I could see, and I couldn't move anything in my body. I couldn't yell, I couldn't talk, but I could see perfectly fine. I just remember thinking in my mind, like, I think I'm paralyzed. Somebody came up from behind and grabbed me, and as they grabbed me, Boom, my body like released. I got myself up onto the sled. And then our Zodiac came in super hot. He's like, Billy just got super up. And he was on the sled like dead. I felt like my leg was snapped in 20 pieces. My ribs felt like somebody drove a car over them. Jerome at this point hit got his friend who was running safety on the ski off the ski. Jerome got on the ski. I jumped on the ski. Just when I jumped, the ski, the ski moved a little bit and I heard Billy was, why my ribs, my ribs. I go like super slowly from the spot to the harbor. We had to go like in idle one miles an hour because of the, the bumps of moving my pelvis and the pain that I was going through. As we're entering the harbor, we're bumping through boats. It was like going through a maze. We got to the ramp where the ambulance was and people were freaking out. I was guarding his leg, picked him up, slowly bought it, brought him to the ambulance, and he just looked up at me, and he had the craziest look in his eyes. I looked at him and I was like, bro, you can't leave me. I thought I knew what fear was. I thought I knew what being scared is, but I truly didn't. Fear is not knowing what's gonna happen next. So like, am I gonna walk again? Like, I didn't even know it was happening. Am I dying? It just kept getting gnarlier and gnarlier. Like, we went into this hospital. They put me onto the x-ray table, and my thing was is that I couldn't move because when I moved, the break in my body would open up and just create a pain that wasn't tolerable. It just felt like I was dying. In the x-ray, we look at it and we're like, isn't that a crack like all the way through his pelvis? As I was laying there and they're just screaming and talking, I said, give me some, somebody give me my, a phone. And they're like, why? And I was like, I got to call Tahiti. And they're like, no, 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 no. And I was like, yes, I do. I just need to hear and know that my children, my wife are there. And I got a phone call from Billy. And I answered it for about Five seconds, I heard deep breathing, and I was like, hello? He was crying and sobbing, and I was like, wait, what the hell happened? What's, hap what's going on? I had an accident, and that uh, it was bad, but I was gonna be okay. What, what happened? And he said, my leg, or my back, or my hips. And he's being very short with me. I'm alive, I'm fine, I'm talking to you, I love you. And he said, I'm gonna be okay, and he hung up. Little do I know like where he's actually at, and 
how bad of the situation was. I organized with my wife's uh, hospital, like private hospital in Casablanca. The ambulance came, picked me up, and it was about, I don't remember, but I think like a three to four hour ride. He was actually in really good spirits once he, once he got to the hospital. You know, like I got to this hospital and I was like, oh sweet, like I'm gonna survive. Went through, got CT scans, x-rays, and they were just like, okay, yeah, you broke your pelvis. You might need to go into like emergency surgery. So I reached out to somebody who's helped me a lot in my past with my injuries, and that's Mossy Reynolds. I reached out to him and I just asked him to please be my point of contact as my medical decision maker. My name is Mossy Reynolds, um, orthopedic uh, surgery sports medicine specialist. I really only hear from uh, athletes urgently when there's something going on, uh, and usually, you know, a pretty significant injury. I didn't know what to make of it. All I heard kind of initially right out of the, um, right away was that he had fractured his pelvis. Give me some x-rays, give me some imaging, give me more information because there is a multitude of injuries that can occur around the pelvis, some being relatively benign, some being quite serious and quite life-threatening. He connected me with Jerome and Jerome was very helpful sending images um, and then kind of relaying uh, my recommendations to the uh, local Moroccan medical care team. His situation uh, was, was very severe. As they looked into the x-rays, the CT scans, it was, okay, I didn't need emergency surgery, but how long can I tolerate this pain? The first night of the hospital, got through it. Next day, the pain meds and all the that they're putting into me really started to come into play. They were giving him anti-inflammatory medicine and I guess they didn't know, but they were giving him too much, which makes it so you have diarrhea. My body had never been put on any of that stuff. They couldn't handle it, and it just rejected it in the worst way possible. They'd have to change his sheets. So they'd have to lift him up, get the sheets out, clean him up. He's just like in so much pain, he's about to pass out. You could hear him yelling from the whole hospital. You know, he would call me and show me that he's sitting in his own feces and I started crying. He said, T, I can't hear you cry. I have to go. And he hung up. I've never seen this side of Billy where he was broken, really broken, physically, mentally, emotionally. Like, I hate to say this, but for the first time I seen him giving up and that's what broke me. Tahiti called, called me to call him and so I FaceTimed him um, just to see, you know, what he looked like clinically, best I could. You know, I, I felt like I'd lost him. Like, he, I just didn't even know who he was. He kept saying, you know, you know, Masi, get me out of here. Masi, I can't breathe, get me out of here. And he started being like, hey, I, I'm having a hard time breathing. What do you mean? He's like, I have this mucus in my lungs. I can't get it out. I can't, like, ah, because that moves my hip and it's too much pain. Like I can't, I physically can't do it. I've tried and I can't get it up. There's no doubt he probably swallowed some water um, during the, the actual injury itself. And so now you're dealing with salt water on the lungs and your lungs aren't expanding at the same capacity because you're laying on your back. And so those start to fill up. He was developing respiratory distress. His heart rate was increasing, just keeping him alive became kind of paramount. So now there's a race of like, Okay, he's got a broken pelvis, his knee's blown to smithereens. He just had diarrhea for three, two, three days. And now his lungs are filling with fluid. And here, I'm in touch with WSL and Tahiti. And I'm like relaying the messages, trying to figure out the flights. Billy had been texting me just saying, hey, these are the best waves I've ever surfed in my life. He was just freaking out. And then we're all sitting there in a meeting. Everybody's phones started kind of vibrating. Someone picked up their phone and said, hey, it looks like Billy got hurt in Morocco. My first interaction with Billy was a WhatsApp text that showed up out of the blue from a Hawaii number that just said, you know, hey, Lou, this is Billy. I'm, help me, I'm dying and I'm scared. Like it wasn't like, 
he got a couple stitches. It was like, okay, this is gonna be somewhat serious. We need to actually put our brains together and figure out, you know, how we can help this along. Dubby Saul had a doctor from Amsterdam come fly over and assess me before they can make a decision. The assessment would then determine, okay, we can take him home on a commercial flight, just in business class. We'll lay him down, but he's gotta be in a wheelchair until then. Well, that's not gonna happen, because he can't sit in a wheelchair. The other option was you take the back five rows of economy in a plane, and they take all the seats out. But then it was like, then you need to book a week in advance because they need to book out those seats. It was like, we're not gonna stay here for another week. Are you kidding me? We also have to remember, this is the most radical thing, is COVID had just started. We've got to get him out of there quick um, because countries were shutting borders like gates going closed. We're in Los Angeles and Morocco is, you know, in the middle of the night. So, you know, information would come in these bursts. And I'm getting texts that are way more frantic and they're way more serious. Just the words that, you know, Billy was saying, I could feel the pain. And all I was just saying is just like, there's gonna be a way, you're going to come home. I will see you when you get home. He's getting worse and worse and worse. It was just a matter of time before something like even gnarlier happened, you know? I woke up around midnight to basically feeling like I was breathing through half of a straw. Literally every breath was getting shorter and shorter and shorter. And I was hitting my hospital alarm over and over and over. I called Koa. I got a call in the middle of the night from Billy. Answer it. Koa, Koa, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. I'm going, like I can't breathe anymore. Get over here right now, like I can't breathe. And then hung up the phone. I thought he was, like, that was the phone call. Like, I don't know if I'm gonna, like, get through this kind of thing. And I got Jerome up, we went there. Koa had given me a call and his heart rate was 120 beats per minute. Uh, we call it tachycardia and that doesn't happen unless something else is, unless something's going on. We got him down into ICU. Just put on like breath support there, helping pump my lungs, helping me breathe. And eventually I was put on just heavy amounts of oxygen. He looked at me in the eyes and he was like, I don't know how much longer I can do this for. I have to leave, I have to go now. So as that information filters and comes back, it completely changes the plan. All of a sudden it's like, no man, this is a 911. He needs his own medical plane that is equipped with everything. I remember just getting a call like, boom, the plane lands at 2 a.m. I made it, I'm going home. At that point when we got on that plane, we strapped him in, it was just like, the biggest relief ever. Two doctors are on my right side, and Cole Smith is just looking directly at me, and I looked at him and I was just like, we did it. Like, we were, we're going home. Flew from Casablanca to France, France to Greenland. Here we are, in the Arctic, refueling, getting Bailey home. And then from Greenland, we went to Canada, as we're in Canada, like, okay, we're about to go. Like, this is the last one. Like, U.S. border's right there. Like, we're, this is a home stretch. Called my wife, my brother, like, they're in L.A. waiting for me to land. It's a simple handoff. He's gonna land in Long Beach. He's going straight to the hospital there. And Graham comes into my office, and he's like, Pat, you will not believe what's happening now. LAX won't accept the plane. And what had started happening was, was the pandemic was shutting down air travel in real time, literally happening as we're talking. Pilot opens the door and is like, LAX Customs denied us. And I was just like, wait, what? So then they were rerouting it to Pasadena. 25 minutes later, the Pasadena airport won't accept the flight as well. And now there's discussions that are starting to happen of like, we're not sure if we can get him out of Canada and get him into the United States. I remembered that my brother-in-law, he flies in and out of uh, Van Nuys a bunch, and I knew that there was international customs there. 
Nuys. And I was like, Van Nuys. Through the grace of God, Van Nuys can accept the plane. And I was just like, start the engine now, please. I think I, I sent a photo to my wife, like me with all this gadgets on me, and I'm like, I got this, coming home. When I landed in Van Nuys, and as they were pulling me out of the airplane, the emotions like started just dumping out of my body of just like all that fear, all that trauma, and just like all this pain. It, everything just seemed to start coming out of me. And it was like craziest moment with Bailey right there. It was like, I feel like all the emotions started flowing. We, we both started crying and we got him in an ambulance. He was taken care of. Like, all you gotta do now is just heal. And that was the, the most emotional moment of my life right there. I just felt that I kinda had survived. Like it was all downhill from there and it was done. But really, it had just began.